Good afternoon. Welcome to the Acoustic Neuroma Association and um, a Facebook Live. We are talking to Dr. Rausch today, um, Dr. Stephen Rausch. He is a professor and vice chair for clinical research in the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery at Harvard Medical School. He is currently a member of the Research Advisory Board of the American Otological Society and the Meniere's Disease Society or Advisory Board of the Hearing Health Foundation. And his clinical and research interests are in um, combined disorders of hearing and balance, including Meniere's disease, autoimmune inner ear disease, sudden deafness, and migraine. And today we are going to talk about the um, vestibular system and acoustic neuroma and how it affects um, uh, disease and recovery and all of that. So um, Dr. Rausch, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. We'll go ahead and do a, um, a quick presentation and then we will have time for questions. So I have some that people have sent in uh, prior to today, but then you can also ask questions in the comments and we'll go ahead and um, get to as many as we can. So um, Dr. Rausch, if you want to go ahead. Great. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to join you this afternoon. I'm going to quick do a screen share and bring up some slides. What I'd like to do is just take the next 20 minutes or thereabouts to, to talk about three things. I, I'll start just telling you I have no disclosures. I do a little bit of consulting once in a while for pharmaceutical or biotech companies, but nothing related to vestibular schwannoma. I wanna cover three topics. And what I really wanna do is give you, uh, I hope a helpful or practical way to think about each of these um, that, that will help you understand uh, maybe your own health issues or family health issues uh, as it relates specifically to vestibular schwannoma, but the concepts I'm sharing with you are generic uh, related to the balance system as a whole. So we'll go through each of these in turn. We'll start just talking about the normal balance system and how it works. So this is a, a block diagram about sense of balance. And it's really important and interesting that sense of balance is different from all the other senses. Each of your other senses gets only a single input, only one kind of information. You see with your eyes or you smell with your nose or taste with your tongue, but balance is different. Balance gets information from all over the place. We have five balance organs in each ear that read head movement. Plus we have vision that tells us where we are. And we have feeling in our muscles and our nerve endings, our joints that come up from the legs and up the spine. And all of these three different kinds of information converge in the balanced part of the brain. And uh, when it arrives there, the brain compares and integrates all of those signals in a very precise way to give you a sense of spatial orientation, a sense of balance. After the brain does that sensory integration task, it does some other processing, and then it sends signals out. Some of those signals go to your eyes, uh, an image stabilization system like in your home video camera. It allows you to drive on a bumpy road and still read the street signs by keeping your eyes on a target even if your head is moving. Some of those signals go out and down the spine so you can stand and walk and dance. And some of those signals go to other parts of the brain to give you perception or awareness of your balance and spatial orientation. They give you the feeling that you're solid and still and steady or that you're not. So it's not the primary target of this presentation, but it is worth noting that mother nature has made a huge investment in our ability to, to be stable and to be mobile. 
Uh, there's so much redundancy in this system, different kinds of information, all different parts of the body. And uh, that's different from all your other senses. It's kind of a curious thing. When something goes awry in any part of this system, whether it's a change in the signals coming from the ear, a change in the vision, a change in proprioception, the, the, the signals coming from elsewhere in your body, if your brain is not processing normally or if the outgoing pathways are not working right, you feel a balance problem. Now, what balance disturbance you feel is very different person to person and illness to illness. And you may feel a floaty boaty lost in space sensation. You may have an illusion of motion that you're spinning or tilting or bobbing up and down like walking on a trampoline. Uh, you may feel like you're falling. And with that disturbance of spatial orientation or motion perception, you may have overflow to other systems. You may feel nauseous. You may sweat. You may have GI distress, either upper GI or lower GI. And you may have anxiety or panic attacks. All of those other parts of the nervous system or parts of the body may be disturbed if balance is disturbed. In evolution, as we evolve from a little organism at the bottom of the ocean to crawling out on land to developing more and more brain power to think and to imagine and to create, each of those higher brain functions is built on the, the more primitive and lower brain function. And knowing which way is up, sensing gravity or being able to orient in space is a very, very early innovation in evolution. So it's very low in the brain, in the brain stem and spinal cord. And our higher brain functions are built on top of it. And so if you have an illness that disturbs those primitive functions, everything built on top of it begins to fall apart. It would be like building a house on an unstable foundation. And so we see all of these other side effects of GI distress and of anxiety and so forth, because the very primitive function of feeling grounded is disturbed. That is not specific to vestibular schwannoma, but to any balance problem. Now, if we have a, a, a disease or an illness, if the changes of that illness are very slow or gradual, the brain makes ongoing adjustments. It recalibrates. When we first learn to balance, the brain learns to take information from the ears and information from vision and information from the rest of the body and weave it all together. And if over time, one of those functions is, is changing slowly, the brain can make gradual adjustments and we don't really notice that. We recalibrate on the fly and this adaptability of the nervous system is called plasticity plastic, adaptable nature of the nervous system. If we have a very sudden change, that's a different story. So uh, if there's a, a very rapid or sudden loss of one of these functions, and in this case, of course, we're talking about signals from the ear. Uh, if I had a skull fracture, if I had an infection, uh, something that suddenly upped the balance signal coming from the ear, my brain is used to saying, well, my left ear says this and my right ear says that. I'm sitting still, I'm turning left, I'm turning right. All of a sudden, the brain is getting a different message. My left ear is not saying anything and my right ear is sending a signal. The signals don't agree. So the brain says, oh, I'm turning. And the eyes say, no, you're not. And there's a sensory conflict. The signals coming in from the different parts of the system don't agree. And all of a sudden, my stomach gets upset and I'm sweating and all of the 
overflow to other systems because of the sensory conflict that comes on with a sudden change in the messages coming into the balanced part of the brain. Now that's really all you need to know. It's practically all I know about the way the balance system works. So let me say something about the way the balance system might recover. This recovery process that I, I told you, it can happen very gradually, but it also can happen eventually, even if there is a big disruption in signaling. And the, the process is called vestibular compensation or vestibular adaptation. And the analogy that I'd like to give you, and I think it's the most useful way to think about vestibular compensation, is that it's like learning a new language. The ear is saying this on the left side, and it's saying this on the right side, and my eyes are saying something, and my muscles and joints are saying something. And when you were an infant and a toddler learning how to sit and crawl and walk, you learned that when my left ear says this and my right ear says that, I'm sitting still or I'm turning or I'm bending over. Well, later in life, if all of a sudden the message changes, you have to learn that new language and the brain has to go through the exact same process that it did when you were an infant and a toddler. Because now when the left ear says this and the right ear says that, it means something different. And we know it's a different part of the brain in learning language, but the analogy is really robust. And so we know that Little kids can learn new languages much faster than I can. And age plays a factor. The plasticity or adaptability of the brain is better in young people and it declines with age. It doesn't mean that a senior can't learn a new language, but it's more challenging. We know that learning a new language requires motivation. You have to get out there and work at it. If you, I, I have patients here in, I live in Boston, near Boston, and many of my patients live in Chinatown. And I have patients who are little old ladies who came over from China 40 years ago, and they don't speak a word of English because they don't have to. They get a Chinese newspaper, they listen to a Chinese radio station, they go to a Chinese grocery. They really don't have any motivation to learn the new language. Their kids have to leave Chinatown and go to work every day. And they are motivated to get up and learn the local language because they want to function in that new environment. We know that language learning depends on practice. My little old lady in Chinatown, who doesn't really work very hard to speak a new language, doesn't learn it. And, and in fact, if, if I was to move to a new country, you know, in a day, I could ask for a cup of coffee and a pastry, or where's the bathroom? But if I stay there for a few weeks and I buy the New York Times and I listen to CNN, I'm not going to learn to speak French. I have to get in there, wade in and, uh, you know, get out of the chair, get out of the hotel room and practice speaking French if I want to learn that language. Same is true for balance. People who sit and are, are couch potatoes, they don't really get up, they don't move around, they don't push themselves really don't learn the new balance language. They need to get up and get moving. And the more they move, the more they practice. And every different movement is like vocabulary. When we walk, the head bobs up and down just a little bit like this. When we are riding in a, in a car or a bus, the head tends to turn side to side as we look around. And so those two movements, the head bobbing yes or no, come back quicker than almost every other movement because we're doing them all the time. We actually don't do this very much. And if your pencil falls on the floor and you lean over from your chair, you might actually fall out of your chair because that's not a thing we practice. So if I'm trying to recover or if I'm trying to have, help my patient to recover from a balance problem, I want their vocabulary of movement to be as broad as possible. I want them gardening. 
I want them down on the floor playing with the dog or with the grandchildren. I want them going to the grocery store so they're looking side to side and when their head is turned, they're looking up and down the rows of food and they're reaching and turning, loading and unloading the dishwasher, loading and unloading the washing machine and the clothes dryer. All of these things of moving the head and the body around in three dimensions broaden our vocabulary and help us become fluent in this new balanced language. Now, if I'm fit and active and motivated, that's the best of all worlds. If I'm hearing impaired, so I'm trying to learn a new language, but I can't actually hear clearly what people are saying, I'm going to have a lot harder time. In the case of balance, we're not just talking about whether a hearing impairment would make a difference, but if somebody has low vision, so the inputs in the vision part of their system are not as good, they're going to be behind. If they have artificial, if they've had a joint replacement, if they had, a, had one or two hip replacements, one or two knee replacements, those titanium joints don't send any information into the balance system. If they have neuropathy, so their feet are numb, they're not sending as much information. Spinal stenosis, disc disease, arthritis in the in the weight-bearing joints in the spine, as I said, low vision. All of these sensory impairments or mobility impairments get in the way of working on that movement and getting all that extra redundant information into the balance system so it can adapt and compensate. And finally, we're each wired a little bit differently. You know that some people are really good with languages and other people are really not. Some people run faster than others. Some are good at math. Some are artistic. We each have different capabilities and capacities. So if we take a patient, a person who was an athlete, they were a figure skater or a gymnast, uh, they were a, an avid skier, and we give them a balance injury or illness, you know, their brain is really pretty good at processing all of this diverse information coming into the balance centers. And they're pretty likely to make a good or excellent recovery. They're not guaranteed, but they're, you know, we have, uh, we're pretty optimistic about that recovery. On the other hand, if we take somebody who always was kind of car sick, they never, when they were a kid, they would never go on the merry-go-round because it always made them throw up. If they ride backwards on the public transportation, on the subway, they get ill. If we give that patient a balance illness, they're already behind the curve. And we can anticipate that their recovery is going to be rocky. Now, when a patient heads into this process of vestibular adaptation, learning this new language, we know before we even start a few things about what this process is going to look like. The first thing is we know it's gradual. It takes time. And as I've already said, I can ask in a day for a piece of pastry and a, and a cup of coffee if I go to a new country. But if I need to talk about plumbing repairs or economic policy, it's going to be months before I'm feeling comfortable in that new language. Learning a new language is effortful and exhausting. You have to really be on your game. You have to concentrate. If you're sick, if you're tired, if you're stressed out, uh, uh, the words don't come. And this is exactly what we hear from our dizzy patients who are in recovery. When they first get up in the morning, they're a little wobbly. Within maybe a half hour, they get their legs, they're pretty good, but by mid-morning, late morning, they're beginning to bang into things and hang on to the furniture when they walk around the room, and they have to go take a nap. And then in the afternoon, they've got another hour or two or three where they're pretty functional, and then they begin to run out of gas again. As the days and weeks go by, the, the functional time in the morning gets longer and longer. The functional time in the afternoon gets longer and longer. Pretty soon they meet and they get a whole day. But by four in the afternoon, they are toast. 
they're just wrecked. And by the time they get home from work, they flop down in the bed and can barely move. They can't come home and cook dinner for everybody. But again, as the days and the weeks and the months go by, the functional part of the day gets longer and longer. Early on and, and for months, patients feel that their balance is best in recovery when they are on their game. They're well rested, they're fit, they're focused, they're feeling good. If they are stressed out, they decompensate. And in the language analogy, imagine you've been living in Paris for six months and you're pretty fluent on day-to-day -day French. If you get in a traffic accident at rush hour at the Place de la Concorde and all of a sudden have 20 irate cabbies screaming at you in French, uh, uh, you are tongue-tied again. You totally lose it. And that's exactly what our dizzy patients do. If they get in a fender bender, they get in an argument at work or at home, they get ill, they all of a sudden, they're hanging onto the walls and they're woozy and they're queasy. And they get a good night's sleep and the dust settles and they're back on track. And, and these speed bumps on the road to recovery are expected, they're temporary, with time they become fewer and fewer. The last thing I wanna say about language as an analogy for balanced recovery. If a little kid moves to a new country, an eight year old or a 10 year old, they, are speaking the language in a couple of weeks and within months they are speaking it like a native, unaccented. If I go to a new country, it does not matter how long I practice and how long I live there, I'm gonna speak with an accent. And that second language will never ever be as effortless as my native tongue. That is not a realistic expectation. I can go to the grocery store, I could give a lecture at work, I could run a business meeting. Everybody's gonna know I was not born in France. I'm gonna have an accent and I'm gonna just have to concentrate a little bit to do my best. And anything that diverts my concentration and my effort is gonna cause a little bit of a a dip in my performance in that new language. And that's exactly what happens in our dizzy patients. I have patients who after their illness are back on a bicycle, they kayak, they rock climb, they ski, they do all their normal activities, but they tell me ever after, it just doesn't feel the same. Now, if they were a professional athlete, I really don't expect them to be back at the same level of performance. I don't expect a ballet dancer, a hot shot ballroom dancer, they're gonna feel the difference. You may lose a few strokes from your golf game. You may not be as slick on the tennis court, but you know, in, in the best situations, we expect people to get back to normal activity because the brain has the capacity to recalibrate and learn this new language. The last thing I wanna, well, let me, I, I'm sorry. This is to remind me to say one other thing about learning a new language. Learning a new language requires that you stay put in the new country. If you have a problem that causes the signal from your balance part of your ear to fluctuate or to be unstable, that's like being in a new country every day or on and off through the day or every few weeks. There's no way to learn the language if I'm in Spain in the morning and France tomorrow and Poland the next day. So that one of the fundamental requirements, the prerequisite for this process of vestibular compensation of learning the new language is you have to stay put in your new country. Your, your balance system, your ear has to establish a new status quo and stay put. And once that happens, then and only then do you begin this gradual process of recovery.
If you're still degenerating, if you're varying, things are all inflamed and sick and angry, or the healing is incomplete, you don't do any vestibular adaptation. The clock is not ticking yet. You're kind of on hold until everything stabilizes and then the work begins. So the last thing I wanna comment on just very briefly is vestibular rehabilitation physical therapy. And this is bringing in somebody else as your coach to help you through this recovery process. And, and forgive me for mixing metaphors, but I'm gonna set aside language for a minute and, and talk about this in, in a different way. When a physical therapist comes in to help you to recover or to help any patient recover, they have two strategies that are engaged to help rebuild your balance. And these are parallel strategies that are happening both at the same time. One of them is to identify the thing that you find most challenging and to practice it. So here's the normal balance system I showed you at the beginning. And if you have an inner ear problem, the signal coming from that ear is different. It may be totally gone, it may be reduced, it may be unreliable, but the brain has to make a change. And just like a figure skater who goes out and practices their spins every day, so they can smile at the end of the routine and not fall over and throw up, the physical therapist can help each patient to, to identify, to pin down what are those movements and positions that you need in everyday life that are not working for you. And let's practice those and practice those and practice those to try to get the best performance possible from your new balance system. Meanwhile, the other strategy that's going on here is called sensory substitution. Now you have multiple inputs into your balance system. You have ears, eyes, and signals from your muscles and joints. And one of those systems is the weak link. And right now we're talking about vestibular schwannoma. That weak link is the signal coming from your ear. But you have other signals that are still reliable, that are not letting you down. And so the physical therapist can work with you to develop routines, exercises, and activities that help build strength in these other systems or help retrain your brain to attend to the reliable information coming from your vision and the reliable information coming up your spine and de-emphasize the less reliable information coming from your damaged vestibular system on the tumor side. So this sensory substitution thing is trainable and the physical therapist is doing both of these things as they work with you week after week. They're having you practice the things that are challenging in a, in a safe way and in a, a, a graduated way, building week on week. And they're giving you behaviors and strategies to train your brain to focus on the best information you've got. Now here, of course, you can see if your vision is low, if your joints are replaced, if you're arthritic, if you have neuropathy, if you've had a concussion, if you have other cognitive or sensory or mobility impairments, you're gonna be way behind the curve trying to accomplish this. But the therapist is still gonna work with you on that process. The basics of vestibular rehab therapy are accomplished in eight to 12 weeks. And by that time, Many therapists will just send you on your way. You graduate, they high five and say, okay, go for it. They've taught you what you need to know. Doesn't mean you're done working on it, but they don't have more to teach you. It's just a matter of practicing and letting your brain recalibrate. Some patients really want a personal trainer, somebody who's gonna crack the whip or, or encourage them, give them a pat on the back and keep them focused on this task. 
Um, and a, a PT can do that, a family member or friend can do that. Sometimes the signals in the ear may change over time. There may be more degeneration, there may be other treatments, there may be other health issues that come along, and the brain's got to do this process all over again. And at that point, maybe going back to the PT is sensible because you really are now learning another language or a new dialect anyway. So those are the things I want to leave you with. The structure of the system and the way it works, the way the brain adapts like learning a new language and the way a physical therapist can focus on certain parts of that process to push it along. And at this point, I would be happy to take questions. I'm gonna shift from the slides back to a regular Zoom page. Great, thank you, Dr. Roush. That was really great. That was a lot of information, um, really informative. Um, we do have a few questions that came up throughout your um, talk. So um, I wanna get right to those. One that came up a couple different times was, uh, is there ever a time that it's too late to start vestibular therapy and kind of going back to your language analogy where you talk about young children and how they can learn a little more easily. If you wait a long time to start vestibular therapy, is it more difficult then to achieve good results? It's a, it's a good question and I can't give an absolute answer. If you were not going to a physical therapist, but you were just sort of going to suck it up and soldier on and do the best you can, we see that, the, that most of the recovery is early on and it gradually tends to hit a plateau. And, at, and not, not specific for vestibular schwannoma, but after any sudden loss of inner ear balance function, whether it's a viral labyrinthitis or a skull fracture, whatever it may be, we generally tell people that uh, the most rapid recovery is at the beginning, it tends to slow down, and any symptoms that you have after two years are likely to be permanent. If you've never had any therapy in all of that time, maybe a therapist could give you some strategies to lift that plateau a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. But generally, we see recovery front-loaded, meaning soon after the injury is better. It's when the brain, it, it gets a little bit down to motivation. And I don't mean your motivation here in your heart of hearts. I mean the brain's motivation. Mm -hmm. if, the bra if the brain is unhappy because the signals don't match and they don't agree with my eyes and my muscles and I, ugh, I feel terrible, the brain is very motivated to fix that. If you miss that opportunity, or if you take a lot of medicine that reduces the feeling of dizziness, that's like listening to the English radio station in Berlin. You're taking away the motivation. And we actually see generally that the sicker you feel, the quicker you recover, because mm -hmm. that awful feeling is the, is the neurological motivation for your brain to recalibrate. And if you just lie there and don't move, don't push it, don't trigger any discomfort, or you take a lot of medication to, to calm the discomfort, why would the brain bother learning a new language? It doesn't feel that bad. Sure. So pushing it speeds the recovery and uh, being active speeds the recovery and just putting everything on hold is slow in the process. Um, as I said, if things in the system are still evolving, if the inflammation from a radiation treatment or the scar tissue from surgery are still evolving, there's a limit how much recovery you're gonna make in the first week after surgery or the first few months after surgery and radiation, but you still wanna be there pushing it along as best you can. Sure. So I wouldn't ever totally close the door on making more recovery, but you do have to be realistic. The last thing I would say about that is as the years go by, we get older. Yeah. We get weaker, we get deconditioned because we've been sitting around not being physically active and mobile. I get a cataract operation. I get, you know, my heart isn't as good. There may be other things that get in the way. Yeah. So 
really strike while the, while the iron is hot, you know, don't delay doing the rehabilitation because who knows what's going to come down the road to get in the way. Okay. Um, we've had a couple different patients come in and say, you know, I didn't do, I didn't, or, or I did do actually therapy right after it, it really didn't, I didn't see a lot of improvement. Should I go back? Should I try it again? Should I continue moving forward with it? And um, I don't know if that would be dependent on time away from treatment or if it's something they should just, you know, as you've said, you have to really work at it. So is it something they should continue to go back and try right. again? So, so it's also a good question. It's important to remember, first of all, that the therapist doesn't treat you. They don't fix this. Mm -hmm. They coach you. They push you, they tailor the activities to your needs, but you do all the work. Mm -hmm. So first and foremost, don't go to a physical therapist and say, here I am, make it better. Right. That is not a realistic, appropriate use of the resource. Right. However, if you're motivated and you're ready to work and push this and, you know, you see the therapist once a week for a half hour or an hour, but you do homework every single day to work on this. And if you're ready to make that commitment, I would say the first step is to go see a therapist who's experienced in vestibular rehab and get an assessment and they will check you out. They'll take a half hour or 45 minutes or an hour running you through a bunch of paces and they will make an assessment of your abilities and disabilities or impairments and they'll tell you whether there's room for improvement with their kind of intervention. And if they kind of check it out and say, you know, I think you're pretty high up on the performance curve. I'm not sure we can make this any better. You're done. Okay. If they say, well, why don't we try it for two or three or four weeks and we'll see if, it, if it's got traction, you know, we'll see if this mm -hmm. has legs. Yep. Great. And, and if they say, yes, we have something to work on, then go for it, you know. But I think you should look to collaborate with the therapist. Don't go there passive and say, fix it. Don't go there and say, you have to do this. Go there ready to look for a partner in better health. That's great. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, specific to acoustic neuroma and the different treatment um, options that we have? We have surgery where, um, well, first of all, are the vestibular nerves always cut in surgery? And then with that, how do those patients differ from um, patients who receive radiation? So the first thing is that when a, a vestibular schwannoma is growing in the substance of one of the, or both of the vestibular nerves, there are two vestibular nerves on each side, Typically, one of them is the site of the tumor and everything else, the other nerve and the facial nerve and the, the hearing nerve, cochlear nerve, are pushed out of the way as the tumor expands. But the, the tumor is growing in the substance of the nerve. And the best analogy I can give you is if you've ever had a kid who got chewing gum in their hair, <laughs> you can think of those nerve fibers like the hair and the chewing gum is the tumor and you know, mom or dad, you just get out your scissors and you cut out the chewing gum because there's no way you're gonna get all of those hairs cleaned out. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the issue for vestibular schwannoma. So when we remove the tumor surgically, yes, we cut the nerve on both sides, uh, on the side closer to the brain and on the side closer to the ear, and we just remove it. And, and often both vestibular nerves are cut just to, you know, physically to get it out. And it may, and maybe even the cochlear nerve is cut depending on which surgical approach is undertaken. And great effort is taken to spare the facial nerve. Now, when a tumor is small, the nerves out close to the ear look like little strands of spaghetti. You know, they're sort of round and they're in a little clump of four nerves. But as the tumor expands in one of the vestibular nerves, the other three nerves begin to get flattened out. And, and if the tumor extends closer to the brain and it's really enlarging, 
those nerves are stretched over the bulge of the tumor. And instead of looking like a, like a, a round wire or a piece of spaghetti, they begin to flatten out like a ribbon and get really thin and splayed, spread out, really hard to see, really hard to separate from the tumor. So as a tumor gets bigger, the success of separating it safely from the facial nerve gets harder, more difficult, mm -hmm. technically. Mm -hmm. But when we operate, we remove the whole tumor. And when the patient wakes up from that surgery, there is no balance signal coming from that ear. And they've just moved to a new country and they're wicked dizzy and they're nauseous and any movement of their head sets them off even worse. And you know, day by day, week by week, they learn the new language because they're in a new country and they're there, they're parked there, they stay put. And frankly, the, the sort of shortest line and the straightest line to good recovery is seen in people who get operated. In the case of radiation treatment, whichever radiation treatment you do, fractionated, gamma knife, which, the name doesn't matter. You're not removing the tumor. You are seeking to slow or arrest the growth Tumor doesn't go away. It's there on MRI forever after. You're hoping it's not going to get any bigger. So, um, radi so no treatment for acoustic neuroma improves balance. It is a guarantee after acoustic neuroma treatment, your balance will be worse than before the treatment. 100% of patients. We never make balance better than before the treatment. In the surgery, we get rid of the signal and then we're depending 100% on your plasticity of your brain, your other sensory systems, the quality of the signal coming from the other ear for your brain to recalibrate and learn the new language. If your brain is good, if your other sensory signals are good, you're motivated, you practice, that's the best recovery we ever see. If you radiate, the tumor is still there and we don't know if any signal is getting from the ear through the tumor to the brain, we don't know if in the process of traveling through the tumor, the signal is getting scrambled or garbled. We don't know if there's scarring and smoldering inflammation. So we expect after radiation, the signal is weaker, but we don't know kind of the quality and amount of signal that's getting through and whether that's going to be useful to the balance system or whether it's going to be undermining to the balance system. Um, I, would, I would make an analogy to hearing here. When somebody has damage to their hearing, they might lose loudness, but they also might lose clarity, which is like a radio station that doesn't tune in very well. Making the radio louder doesn't give you a satisfying listening experience because the signal is trashy. And the balance signal coming through your tumor was a bit trashy and the brain had some time to slowly adapt to it. But once you radiate it and make all that inflammation and scarring, it's going to be even weaker and maybe worse. Mm -hmm. So I think generally we, we are more likely to see smoldering balance problems in radiated patients than operated patients. But it's not a black and white issue. It's a gray issue. And... Uh, I, can only, I, I can only encourage you to think hard, talk a lot to your doctors before you make a treatment decision. You know, in carpentry, they say measure twice, cut once. Mm -hmm. um, all of the, you know, kind of weighing the options about what's the chance my hearing is going to last longer What's the, you know, what, what does my balance recovery look like? What are the risks of going to the operating room? You know, what, what are the risks to my facial nerve? You really want to weigh those because it's different for every single patient. And it's not just that the, the statistics are different, it's that the patient's personal needs and priorities are different. And we don't have one size fits all recommendations. And, and I, I can't stress enough that you need to work with a, a neurotology surgeon and or a radiation therapist who are willing to take the time with you to kind of march through all those different priorities and considerations, 
get a second opinion, get a third opinion. I don't think the best information is going to come from your hairdresser or your car mechanic. Um, I think it needs to come from healthcare professionals experienced in care of these problems, but there is no black and white decision here. And eventually you need to make your decision and then you live with the consequences. Okay. When you are talking to your patients and they, um, they want to get back to things that they did before, you know, you were kind of talking about your patients who ski and climb mountains and all that kind of stuff, but it just doesn't feel the same. We had a question um, from someone who said before she was even ever treated, um, she had an accident on her bike and, and then realized later that it was likely a, a dizziness issue that potentially came from her acoustic neuroma. And so she's considering getting back into it, but is nervous about it. Um, so how do you, how do you um, counsel your patients when you talk, when they are talking about trying to get back into those right. things that really mattered in their lives before their treatment? So the first thing is that I, I personally, in my practice, I am a very strong advocate of people getting back to be as the people they want to be, as normal as they can, and to be realistic and be respectful of boundaries of safety. Mm -hmm. um, and one way that I think about that is that all of us, each of us has certain expectations in our lives. As we look into the future, we see a trajectory of our path in our life. And when we get a health problem, we, we, we crash. We, you know, we had a certain expectation and now we're down here not meeting those expectations. And uh, it could be from a heart attack, it could be from a broken leg, it could be from a vestibular schwannoma. When we go to the healthcare system, we ask that healthcare system to bring back our performance, put us back on the rails of the trajectory that we envision. And every doctor and every nurse and radiation therapist and PT, they are all working hard to push your level of performance back where it was or where you want it to be. However, we don't get people back to the original path very often. And so there's a bit of work that each patient has to do to re-envision their trajectory. So I can bring your, help you bring your performance up but you might want to dial your trajectory down or at least to a, a different direction. When those two lines are separated, the reality and the expectations, patients are frustrated, they're sad, they're angry, they're bitter. And when we can gradually bring those lines to meet, patients get on with their lives. And whether you can do this re-envisioning of your trajectory by yourself or with your psychotherapist or with your partner or whomever it is, it's a mandatory piece of recovery from illness, not just vestibular schwannoma, any illness. So just to come back to the specific question, I want people to do everything they feel safe doing. I don't want them to fall and break a hip or get a concussion. So the first thing is, can you walk securely? If you feel like you can walk and you wanna try pedaling a bike, get on a stationary bike. The stationary bike that causes the least head movement is the kind you sit in, a recumbent bike. Go to the Y or go to a gym and sit in the recumbent bike and practice pedaling at you know good speed and see if you can do that for five minutes, 10 minutes, a half hour, get your heart rate up, get your fitness built up gradually, get your legs in shape. And you don't do a lot of bouncing in that recumbent bike. Once you can do that and you feel pretty good, get on the spin bike where you're leaning in a real cycling position. And when you pedal fast in that position, your head bounces up and down and bobbles and see how you feel. And when you can tolerate it, then imagine looking back to see if there's a car coming while you're pedaling, because you're going to have to do that. And, and if that's a, a vocabulary word that you don't have yet, if you are out on the road, on the shoulder of the road, and you do that and crash your bike, you, you set yourself back 
months and years, maybe permanently. So you have to practice the movements you're going to do when you get out on the bike. And then you go to an empty parking lot on a, on a nice day where there's nobody going to be around to get in your way and you give it a try. Mm -hmm. But it, it's, it's, it's graduated with safety as the, the boundary. Okay. And if you don't feel safe doing it, please don't do it. Don't yeah. be stupid. Yeah. Um, that kind of leads me to another question. We always, anytime we do any, um, any of our webinars or, or um, Facebook lives on, on balance, um, patients ask about um, exercises. Can you give them exercises? Can you give them things to do? Can you, you know, can you offer them um, things that they can look up online? And um, so I wonder how you, uh, how you would answer that question and how you feel about that. We're cautious because we don't want people to fall. So, but you know, I don't, as a vestibular therapist, how do you, you know, how do you answer that question? Right. So uh, for people who are lying in their hospital bed the day after surgery, I start them on some very simple head and eye exercises. And it's the, it's the vertical movement and the side to side movement that begins to recalibrate uh, or, or coordinate head and eye movement. I have them look at a target on the far side of the room, like a light switch and keep their head looking at that light switch and slowly turn their head side to side, keeping their eyes right on the target. And then I have them do it with their thumb, a near target, same thing, side to side, near and far target. Mm -hmm. And then I have them do the same movement vertically, look at the light switch, move your head up and down and then do it with your finger, move your head up and down. So the, the target is still, but the head is moving horizontal and vertical, near and far. And then I flip it around and I have them keep their head absolutely still and pick two targets and move their eyes side to side or up and down, near and far targets. So head still, eyes moving, eyes still, head moving, near target, far target, horizontal and vertical, all the, the permutations. And they can do that sitting in bed. They can do it for a couple of minutes. They'll start feeling nauseous, give it a rest. An hour later, do it again. An hour later, do it again. All through the day, start, do some simple head and, and eye movements. You know, if they have risk factors for slow recovery, if they're obese, if they have joint replacements, if they have other, you know, low vision, we get a physical therapist in the very next day to start doing some falls risk management how to safely transfer from bed to chair so they can begin to move around in the house. We get them a walker so that they can move around in the house. But really, I'm the, I'm the MD. That's not my job. That's the physical therapist or occupational therapist for that early advice about how to begin moving in a safe way. Um, if you're talking about beyond that, it was the things I already spoke about. The wider the variety of movements, the better. The daily activities, that everybody should be out walking and moving around. Everybody should be doing ADLs, activities of daily living, loading and unloading the dishwasher. Going to the grocery, go, grocery shopping is incredible vestibular rehab. You've got a cart to hang on to. You're walking down this aisle with everything coming at you. You're turning your head side to side. You're looking up and down. You're reaching and bending. You're reaching down and lifting up. It's pretty provocative. I mean, you aren't going to be able to do that the first week or two after surgery. But that kind of activity is fabulous. Playing with the dog, playing with the grandchildren, puttering in the garden, all of those things are really great. Getting on a mountain bike you know, that's not going to retrain your balance at the beginning or in the, you know, in the early and mid stages of recovery. I have a, a, a favorite resource that I recommend to all my patients with balance problems or who even just want to have better balance. Um, it's a book. I did not write it. I wish I did. It's the smartest, cleverest book about balance that I've ever seen. Um, so I'm going to put in a plug for it. I don't really even know the author, although when I saw the book, I did send her an email telling her how much I loved it. Mm -hmm. And she sent me back a thank you note. The book is called Better Balance for Life. It's written by Carol Clements, okay. C-L-E-M-E-N-T-S. It's about 15 bucks on Amazon. 
Can I say Amazon? I'm not oh, yeah. giving a plug yeah. for Amazon either. That's fine. Um, <laughs> anyway, it's about 15 bucks online. It's a little paperback book and you don't have to buy any equipment. You don't have to join a gym. It's a whole bunch of little things that you bake into your everyday life. Stretches and strengthening and movements. You do them lying in bed. You do them while you're brushing your teeth, while you're standing at the sink doing the dishes. It is so clever and smart and it's applicable to anybody who wants to have better balance. Now, if you want to kick it up a notch, go take a yoga class, take a Tai Chi class. There's been a lot of research showing uh, balance benefits of Tai Chi. Maintaining your general mobility balance is a use it or lose it capacity, couch potatoes, balance decline, people who walk a lot and bend and turn and move uh, get, you know, have better balance. Yep. Okay. Push it. That's great. That's great. We're getting to the end of our time, but I had two questions come in that are both really, I think, really good ones, and I wanted to ask them both. Um, so one was, do hearing aids have any effect on balance whatsoever? Do they help with balance? And the second is, do um, does your level of fitness that um, before you are treated have anything to do with kind of the point at which you start your recovery? Or does everybody after treatment kind of start at the same point? Uh, let me uh, uh, let me do the, the, the hearing aid question first, because that one's a little easier. Um, the answer is yes, hearing aids help, but maybe not in the way you think. Okay. Um, we, the brain is eager for all the kind of sensory information it can get and our orientation in the world depends on that. So if you are a little bit cut off from the world around you, you're just not on your game in quite the same way. And so being able to communicate easily, hearing that the phone is ringing, hearing the doorbell, hearing that there's a car coming, all of those kind of things contribute to a general sensory awareness that is absolutely beneficial in somebody who's a little bit unsteady. Now, there's a little bit of research that actually says if you take somebody who is uh, hearing and balance impaired and you, you put them in a, in a research study in a physical therapy runway and you have them close their eyes and walk and they're weaving all around, if you put on hearing aids, some people have a little less weave, but it's a, it's a very small benefit and not everybody gets it. Okay. And so I would not tell you to go buy hearing aids to improve your gait stability, but I really would tell you to get hearing aids to improve your quality of, if you need them, if you're hearing impaired, get them to improve your quality of life and your ability to interact with the world around you. The other question, remind me, um, that one is your level of fitness before you're treated. Right. Um, so how off balance or dizzy you feel after treatment compared to before treatment depends on the delta, the amount of change. If your ear has been degenerating, degenerating, degenerating slowly for years um, from a tumor growing there, and your doc can do some pre-op balance testing. And if they see that the signal on that side is very weak, and then the surgery just snuffs that last little bit, the patient wakes up from surgery, they're dizzy, but they actually make a pretty quick recovery because their brain has done a lot of the recalibration already. If the ear is still sending a lot of information and you cut that nerve, the patient wakes up and they're very dizzy. But that also makes the brain very motivated to do the recovery. So it's not like you can't give an absolute answer who's going to recover faster than somebody else. When you have to balance, if the information getting to the balance part of the brain is not so great, you're depending more on your muscles and joints, more on your vision, your, ref your reflexes, your agility, how mobile your joints are, how strong your muscles are, is called into action. Mm -hmm. And if you are pretty mobile and pretty fit and strong and you have mobility and agility and strength, that's gonna help you. And if you're kind of, you know, shriveled up or weak or rickety or stiff and arthritic and out of shape, you don't have the agility and the strength and the flexibility. 
And if you start to go over, you're going down because mm -hmm. you don't have the, the physical resources to, to adapt to, to the fall. Stop that from happening. Um, so yes, I guess is the long, that was, that, that was a long answer, but yes, the better shape you're in beforehand, uh, the better prepared you are to handle things when you come out the other side. Great. Well, that is all the time we have today, but I really want to thank you because uh, those were, the, for everyone that submitted questions, those were great questions. And thank you for taking the time to answer them. Um, thank you for taking the time to uh, bring this information to us and do this presentation. We really appreciate it. And we're so grateful. And um, I know that it's helped a lot of people. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Nice to be here. Well, Have a great evening. Great. Thank you so much. You too.